Dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, dear co-educators, um, I'm greeting you uh, from the International School of Tomorrow, Moscow, Russia. My name is Len Stolarchuk, and I'm the CEO of the International School of Tomorrow and the coordinator of the School of Tomorrow in the CS and the Baltic States, which is the former USSR. Uh, thank you for the privilege of sharing with you at your Christian Educators Conference. And thank you, Brother Yoko, for asking me to do this session for your educators. Uh, as we were discussing with Brother Yoko about the theme or the topic of my talk, we agreed that we will call, you, call it looking back, looking forward, and looking up. Because today we live in the time of uncertainty. And this topic is mentioned in every conference, in every seminar, almost in every session. And uh, it is important for us to understand how we go through this time in a way that we not only survive, and as a matter of fact, I don't quite like the word survive. I prefer the word prosper. How do we prosper in the time of uncertainty? And of course, when we talk about it, we need to understand how God has been working in our life and in the life of our organization, of our school, so that we got to where we are and how he actually helped us to go through all the hurdles and challenges. Looking back is an important part of understanding how God is working in our life. And it is not looking back in a way that we would turn into pillars of salt when God tells us not to look back, but look forward. And yet, if we take such a character from the Bible and if we approach it from the biblical perspective, uh, we will see how things have been working or how things were working in the lives of those people who were led by God. And of course, well, even those characters as AC and Christy and, uh, okay, Baba and uh, Wags and even the little kitty cat Patches, uh, how they also live in the time of uncertainty because as kids encounter them in the paces and they walk with them, uh, all these characters, they don't know what is going to happen with the words that kids are going to put in, and they also need God to go through all those challenges. And you know, Russia is known for matryoshka dolls, and we believe that as you open every matryoshka and you just look on the inside and you find still another character, it's always a surprise. And with matryoshka dolls, it's usually a pleasant surprise. Not so in life. Not so in life, and sometimes we encounter very challenging circumstances and situations when we have to work through those things, and only with God's help we can do it. And uh, as I was looking at the Bible, and I was, as I was thinking about uh, different people, m the name of Moses came to my mind as the first character, the man who was able to lead the people of Israel uh, through all the challenges of uh, the Egyptian land and the Egyptian kingdom, when after the good time that were introduced by Joseph, lots of pharaohs changed and they did not remember already uh, what the Israelites did for them and how they blessed them. And now Moses and his people are experiencing slavery in its worst Form. And first thing that happened to him, one of the miracles that happened, and that's what we need to remember, the miracles that God performed in our life. And this miracle was the burning bush. When God spoke to Moses and the bush was burning and was not consumed by the fire, that's how he knew it was from God. And he told him that he would lead his people into the promised land. It was difficult for Moses to believe. And we all know this story, and we heard lots of sermons about it, how 
he had to overcome all his all his shortcomings and how God was giving him miracle after miracle to prove that this was going to happen. The same way when Dr. Howard first heard this repeated Bible verse that was coming to him over and over again from the book of Revelation chapter 3 verse 8. I have set before thee an open door that no man can shut. He was wondering, is it God talking to him? Because at that time, School of Tomorrow was already more or less established in America. Uh, there were schools that were being set up by churches not without struggles, not without challenges, but yet it was within the realm of Christian education. And now there's this call, I have said before thee an open door that no man can shut. He was in the mountains of Colorado on his sabbatical. And he flipped his Bible open and this verse came up, I have said before thee an open door that no man can shut. Then he goes to the church the same, the next day, and the preacher is preaching from the book of Revelation 3.8, I have set before thee an open door that no man can shut. Dr. Howard was wondering, what was that? What is God trying to tell him through this Bible verse? And around that time, in about a month or two, the iron curtain fell in the communist realm in Europe. And somehow it became very clear that this is the direction to go, that he needs to go to Europe, he needs to go to Russia, and he needs to do what God called him to do, namely to start Christian education. And he goes right into the Ministry of Education because this burning bush was talking to him, and miraculously, miraculously, the Memorandum of Understanding uh, allowing the School of Tomorrow to be placed in a public school was signed by the Minister of Education, Mr. Eduard Niprov. That's how the School of Tomorrow started in the beginning of the 90s in Russia. That was first miracle. And the same response that he gave to God as Moses gave to the burning bush. You know what? In my life, a couple of years ago, Almost the same thing happened. I was studying at the university in Nizhny Novgorod at the interpreter's department. And after graduation, I had a dream. I wanted to become the United Nations interpreter. And uh, I went to Moscow to enter the training course with the United Nations. And everything seemed to be going fine, except for one thing. I underestimated the importance of the dress code when I came to the interview of the United Nations board. I entered the door, and the chairman just looked at me like this and said, uh, looked at my outfit, which was not a suit, not a tie, not a white shirt. And he said, uh, <laughs> thank you, next. That was the end of my interview. That was the end of my interview. I failed big time. My dream to become the interpreter of the United Nations went down the drains, but I was determined. I was determined and I came next year and I came this time for the interview in my best suit, all spiffy. And uh, I just went through the interview with flying colors and everything was fine, except for one thing. The chairman lined us up and told us, you know what, we changed the policy of employment of interpreters at the United Nations headquarters. And now, instead of three years, they will stay there for five years. And, young gentlemen, I'm sorry, all men stayed. So this year, we are enrolling all the girls. <laughs> and I thought, oh no, that was the second time I failed. I failed big time. And I thought, I should have worn a dress, not a suit, to be enrolled. Okay, one way or the other, I had to just keep going. And I thought, I st I'm still going to do it. And uh, in the transition period between the first interview and the second one, 
I began to do ESL, English as a second language. And uh, somehow over this one year period of time, I realized that I love teaching. And by the end of this year, there was just another dream emerging that not only it is good to become a United Nations interpreter, but maybe it would be great to start my own school. And at that time, I had my own idea how to do it. I called it Lens Center, which is learn English naturally. I wanted to have uh, foreign people in my school. I wanted to have authentic materials. And uh, I thought, since I haven't, I, since I did not enter the United Nations training, I might just as well start my own ESL center. Hmm, interesting. I did start it. And it was very successful. I had groups, I had individual learners, but I still was dreaming about a bigger center, something that maybe would be similar to Berlitz Center, which is one of the most famous. ESL or foreign language centers in the world. But in some of 1982, something happened. Uh, I found out that Olga, my wife, was who was visiting with her parents at that time, uh, outside of Moscow, she got a case of appendicitis. And uh, because of this, uh, I had to really rush from Moscow to her place and I thought, yes, I have to be there, and I have to be there with her. But as I came to the train station, I found a group of Americans, Canadians, and they were all going somewhere. As I found out later, there were missionaries going along Russia to preach and to minister uh, to the orphans in prisons. And as I was talking to them, and as we were riding on this train, I helped them with translation, they were praying, and I was just wondering why in the world I'm on this train and why am I helping them? Somehow, somewhere in the course of our ride, the leader of this group came up to me and he said, Len, would you mind going with us because we need interpreters, we have, we have 50 people on this train and we need somebody to help us. And I said, absolutely not because my wife is in the hospital and I need to be with her. And he told me then, Len, you need to ask God what to do. And you know, I didn't know what really, <laughs> how to handle this, to ask God, because I was not saved. Uh, actually, my previous experience was with the KGB military service. I was one of the leaders of the Communist Party in our university. And um, it was really a challenging thing to do, to ask God <laughs> what to do. <laughs> But I had my Bible with me. And you might be wondering how in the world I had my Bible with me. But my Bible came from one of the sessions uh, of our uh, course of literature when uh, our professor once said that the level of your education is determined by quickness of your references. And he would use this phrase, to everything there is a time, and he would ask, what is your reference? And then he would say, if you say it's from the Bible, it's good. If you say it's from the book of Ecclesiastes, it's wonderful. If you can quote Ecclesiastes 3.1, this is a very exact reference. And then your level of education is really high. And I knew that the world literature, 60, 70, 80% was based on the Bible. So I bought my Bible and I had my Bible with me because I wanted to be an educated person. Hmm. I thought, all right, ask God what to do. So I flipped the Bible open. And I thought, whatever verse I find will be my answer. So I flipped the Bible open. And uh, whew, I'm in book of Luke, chapter 18, verse 29. And I'm reading. And he said unto them, so Jesus told him, his disciples, Verily I say unto you, there is no man, that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive, this verse 30, who shall not receive manifold more, and in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. And I thought, well, 
All the words are here. I need to follow God. I need to follow Jesus so that all these things will be with me and life everlasting in the world to come. So I close the Bible and I tell the leader, I'm going with you. To cut a long story short, this little lady told me, Len, you never take the Bible out of context. You need to know exactly what it refers to. You should not just flip it open and, and do what, what you read. Because And he quoted this, this thing. One young man decided to commit suicide. He flipped the Bible open and he reads. So he did. I'm sorry. This is not biblical. This is not what the Bible says. He did it. It was a different context. But this time it was very, very meaningful. And uh, it was something that really related to what I was doing later on. Because with this group, I found somebody who was associated with the School of Tomorrow, the Strathers family. And I got involved with the School of Tomorrow and with my ministry that somehow was really my dream coming true because that was the center I was dreaming about with foreigners, with authentic curriculum, with all proper things that I've, I've been dreaming about at that time. Hmm. But uh, if in the beginning it was all wonderful and it was all the bed of roses like the honeymoon, and some of you can refer to the honeymoon who had this experience, but later on, as it was with Moses, the plagues came. The difficulties came, and uh, of course, uh, God was using those plagues for Moses so that the heart of Pharaoh would be hardened first, but ultimately, through those plagues, it would be proven that the God of Moses had power more than any other God. And there was the water turned into blood and frogs and lice and gnats and fleas and flies and diseased livestock and boils and hail and locusts and darkness, and even the death of the firstborn, after which Moses was able finally to lead his people out of the land of Egypt. So when the School of Tomorrow began, we had all kinds of good things happening, and in the, at the initial stage, there was a great enrollment. There were five, ten students per one seat at the school, and it was so wonderful. But time was progressing, time was flying, and uh, the, the legislature also got shaped up. Finally, they introduced uh, private education, and the first licensing came. Hmm. Even despite the fact that at the initial stage, the Ministry of Education signed the Memorandum of Understanding with an understanding that there was Bible right in the curriculum. By the year 1995, uh, the things changed, and the uh, Christian aspect was not as welcome, uh, welcomed in the curriculum as it was before. And our first licensing is coming up, and we invited our lawyer to give us a piece of advice. Our lawyer goes into the learning center, looks at all the kids, looks at our students' offices, he sees the Bibles in their offices, and he says, you know what? I understand everything, and I appreciate what you're doing. As a Christian person, I'm telling you, of course, leave everything intact. But as a lawyer, I'm telling you, just take the Bibles away. Just take them away for one day. When the inspection is over, you can put them back in. And uh, with this message, he left. <laughs> we got together, we prayed, and we thought, what do we do about it? What will happen if tomorrow kids are going to come to school, inspection or inspection, and they find no Bibles in their offices? What kind of message are we going to convey to them? So we decided to leave everything intact. The inspector comes, and she goes all around the school. She goes around the offices. She looks at the Bibles, and uh, she looks at the environment. She looks at the flags that we have, Russian-American flag. And there were two together. And then she says, uh, Mr. Len, would you please mind coming to your office? I need to have a talk with you. 
So we come into the office and I thought, well, we probably should have followed the piece of advice of our lawyer, <laughs> not his piece of advice as a Christian man. And the lady sits with me. She just sits in front of me and she says, I have a question to ask. Why do you have... Okay, so that's... Now it's coming. Why do you have the American flag in your learning center? That was the only challenging question she had. And that was the easiest one to answer because we said, oh, we are a bilingual school, we're on a bilingual program, that's why we have the Russian flag and an American, an American flag side by side, uh, uh, symbolizing our bilingualism, symbolizing that we run a bilingual school, a dual program. And that was an easy question to answer. She never asked a single question about the Bible. And they were all in the students' offices. So that was a miracle how God allow, allowed us to go through the first licensing process. And we knew that now we are stronger. Now we, we knew that we were covered. And uh, we also, of course, being the center of the School of Tomorrow in the CS and the Baltic States on the former USSR territory, of course, we, like you do, we deal with containers, with shipping of curriculum. And uh, one day, one day, we had a really challenging situation with the container. It was summertime, and uh, I was on my vacation when the chief accountant called me and said, uh, Mr. Len, I'm sorry to say, but we have only 10,000 rubles in our bank account. So 10,000 rubles at the time was about uh, maybe $400. And uh, she said that uh, in order to clear the container, we need to pay 250,000 rubles. And uh, unless we do that, our bank account is going to be, of course, with this payment is going to be depleted. And also we need to pay taxes. We need to pay taxes in the amount of 250,000 rubles. Uh, we knew if our account is, so to speak, frozen by the tax people, it would take another two to three weeks to get it back into operation. And we couldn't afford it because it was the middle of August and our school would begin in a couple of weeks. Uh, we prayed. We prayed because we didn't know what to do. There was no money, period, on our bank account. And the next day, our friends, our partner school from Moldova, that always makes and places big orders with us, they transferred, guess how much? They transferred exactly 250,000 rubles the next day. Just the day when our bank account was supposed to be shut down. And we were able to pay taxes, we were able to clear the container, and it all happened in this miraculous way. And then I can actually relate to what was happening with Moses and with the people of Israel. Because after the first maybe 10 years, our international school began to wander from one facility to another. And when it was about time for us to shut down, and there was just one period of time when we had to shut down for one month because we couldn't find a facility and we were kicked out from the previous one, when the landlord, in order to force us out because they wanted bigger rent, they actually shut down all the water. And for two weeks, we were actually cleaning toilets by ourselves. Then the next two weeks, our students were studying at the teachers' homes, gathering by groups of five to ten people. You're talking about pandemic now? You're talking about being on the lockdown? Well, it's actually, it's an easy way as compared to what we had, about 10 to 15 students coming to teachers' homes and working right there from home. That was a different ball game. That was really challenging. And I remember that the new facility opened up just overnight, and we had only two days to move the whole school down to this new facility, and it was a miracle how things started. And ultimately, we wound up in this facility. And I would say that uh, coming over here was still another miracle, because 
the lady from the Department of Education, she came to inspect our school. And when she saw that our former facility was not meeting all the codes uh, as a school, she told us, you need to move or else. Else meant or you are shut down. And later on, she shared this thing. She goes to her boss and she said, I was going to my boss's office to tell her to shut down the model school of tomorrow. That was another name of our school at the time. And when she came to her office, she said, I didn't know what happened to me. But I came to her office and I said to my boss, look, there's a very good school there at Damadelska 44, the name of the street. And they are really in need of a better facility. Could we help them? Instead of telling her, shut them down, she said, can we help them? And in a matter of one month, they found this facility where we're present now, where we're currently residing as a school. That was another miracle that God actually put us through, like all those miracles that God gave Moses so that his people could be in the promised land. So we can say that at that time we had not only the facility, but we had manna from heaven, we had water from a stone, and we basically moved into this facility. It was like parting of the Red Sea. And God was really helpful and we really experienced all those things. So we saw how things were developing and now we are in this new facility, in this beautiful place with the students doing a lot of things and with even the pandemic period being in place, we know that God is still in control. And over this one year of being on the lockdown and going back and forth from online to offline and or in a combined version, we realized that we have grown. We have acquired new skills. We learned uh, new ways of doing things and we actually in some areas expanded our ministry and expanded our opportunities. Yes, we shrank a little bit in our uh, campus-based complement of students, but our online students body has grown considerably. And we believe that this is not the end, but this is uh, something that God wants us to do. What is to expect further? We don't know. We don't know because we live in the time of uncertainty and God opens only one page at a time to us. And uh, as, it say, as the Bible says, uh, we are not entitled to know everything. Yes, we can envision some tendencies. Yes, we can predict some things. But by the end of the day, it is God's plan for every one of us. And... Uh, if you look at the book of Jeremiah 29, 11, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. We read, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And I believe as we look back, as we look at our current situation, and as we look up, we need to remember that God is giving us hope and the future so that we could serve him and glorify his name. God bless you.